may I say uh, how delighted I am to welcome you this afternoon uh, to this webinar of the Institute for International and European Affairs with General Claudio Graziano, who is the chair of the EU uh, Military Committee. Uh, before I uh, formally introduce the general and uh, hand over the floor, there are just a couple of housekeeping or technical uh, issues just to bring to your attention. Um, the first in terms of structure is to say that the general will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll go to a Q and open Q&A uh, with all those attending. Uh, in order to participate in the question and answer session, I would invite you to go to the bottom of your screen and use the Q&A function, which allows you to submit uh, specific written questions to the general. Uh, I would also ask that you identify yourself and or your institution, just so that I can introduce the question uh, appropriately uh, to the general. Um, the, uh, the chat function is in fact disabled, so uh, we need you to use the, the Q&A function uh, for this part of the, of the webinar. Um, I'd also say that, uh, remind everybody that the session today, both the general's remarks and the Q&A session itself is on the record. Uh, and therefore, if you wish to, to tweet uh, over, over the course of the webinar, you're more than welcome to do so uh, using the at IIEA uh, tag. Uh, and now, as I say, it gives me enormous pleasure to, uh, to welcome General Graziano to the Institute for International and European Affairs uh, here in Dublin. Uh, General Graziano was appointed, uh, as you may be aware, about a year ago in November 2018, having served previously as uh, Chief of Staff of the Army uh, between 2011 and 2015, and Chief of the Defence Staff between 2015 and 2018. Uh, the General's operational experience includes, uh, uh, includes operations in uh, Mozambique, uh, in Lebanon, and indeed in Afghanistan. Um, and as an academic, I have to say I'm delighted to welcome a true soldier scholar, um, because General Graziano has two bachelor's degrees and two master's degrees. So General, if you're ever thinking of a PhD, uh, please, do give us a please do give us a shout. Um, yeah. but, as, but as I say, without further ado, uh, General, you're very, very warmly welcomed and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Ms. Donagall. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. As you may know, my virtual uh, participation today happened in the year of uh, the physical presence uh, in Ireland, which was scheduled for this period, but was unfortunately postponed due to COVID restriction. And by the way, today I'm also in self-isolation because one of my staff was tested uh, positive, but it's um, very okay, and uh, it's a rules of the European Union seven days. I hope I will be able to come to Dublin as soon as possible, when condition allows that again, I hope is very, is very soon. But today I'm very gladly to welcome the opportunity to interact with such a distinguished audience on a paramount such subject like the challenging to European Union defense. Now, uh, let me just quickly explain the role uh, within the European institution. As it was said, I am uh, the chairman and the spokesperson of the European Union Military Committee since November 2018. The committee is composed by 27 European Chiefs of Defence who convene personally or two military permanent representatives to bring uh, that important the end user perspective and the military voice in all relevant European Union decision making process. In Taraglia, the military committee directs all the military activities within the European Union framework. In particular, the planning and execution of European Union military mission and operation. And as chairman, I am also the primary point of contact for their command. Additionally, my committee gives military advice to the political and security committee, to the political and security committee, and make recommendations on military matters defining the requirement for all military needs and capabilities in accordance with the agreed level of ambition. All this, of course, put me in the required position to properly support the high representative by President, Mr. Morell, as his advisor for all defense and security matters. As I said, I'm really looking forward to interact with the competent forum from a very important European Union member state. It has always been on our side with full solidarity since 1973, 
the year of accession to European Union. Let me start by saying that in the specific domain of security and defense, Irish traditional neutrality has not prevented Ireland from taking up its responsibility as part of the United Nations and European Union-led missions aimed at peacekeeping and preventing humanitarian disasters like in Mali, Bosnia Herzegovina, or Chad, without forgetting Lebanon, of course. I keep a vivid memories of highly trained Irish soldiers deployed in Unibit and very good staff officer during my three years there as force commander and uh, head of mission. And the UNIFIL is a very peculiar mission because it's a United Nations mission, but in reality, when it was deployed, it was deployed under the European Union speeches with a large number of European country and uh, personnel. Equally relevant has been the contribution that the Irish Navy has provided to Operation Sophia, saving hundreds of lives in the Mediterranean water. In this regard, I believe that the continuity of commitment by Dublin in the new operation Irini for the arm embargo in Libya would send a very powerful message of commitment and border sharing for security to all European Union member states. Last but not least, we must also recognize the effort by, made by Ireland in several European led civilian operations. In sum, a really great commitment for which we are truly grateful and for which I must thank also the Chief of Defense, Armina Mellet, who I believe is also attending this event. Uh, anyway, hi Mark, I'm looking forward to meeting you again at our third meeting early November, virtually this time and in person as soon as possible. Now, the Irish Committee, in my opinion, proves two fundamental points. Firstly, that Dublin has embraced the European Union project for an effective and credible European defense, showing solidarity whenever needed and possible. And second, that Ireland has fully acknowledged the concept of what we call the butterfly effect. No matter how geographically far, which is indeed the case of Ireland, the effect of a crisis will eventually reverberate on you, possibly amplify. And this is even more valid for the modern threats, cyber, hybrid, disinformation, with no, with no, no boundaries of distance, like the pandemic. Now let's start with crisis and the pandemic. 2020 has been a really tough year. I think it is a turning point in the history of Europe. Something will be recalled as the most important year after maybe the Second World War. In addition to the continuous malignous activities by pilot and rogue states and no state entities, hybrid and cyber attacks, disinformation, in addition to the traditional conventional uh, threats, we have seen the surge of new menace, like the one related to the health or even energy, the latter being the seismic element that will characterize the security scenario in the next 10 years or more. Moreover, the ongoing crisis in Libya, in the East Med Sea, in Belarus, in Armenia, or in Azerbaijan, tell how complicated and interwinded in the security scenario around us, also in our very close neighborhood. And on top of this, the coronavirus outbreak that has further amplified the instability with medium to long term effects yet to be fully measured and understood. Somebody make a comparison between uh, uh, the new pandemia and Spaniola. Maybe somebody can even make a comparison between the pandemia and uh, uh, September the 11th, when the attack at the Twin, Twin Tower happened, that changed completely the, our way of living and also pandemic is changing our way of living. In this regard, as highlighted in the Global Study of 2015, the European Union has undertaken an ambitious journey to become a reliable security provider and partner at a global scale, being the only organization that can count on a complete set of tools of its disposal, economic, political, diplomatic, and yet also the military one. In fact, maybe we are known for this for a while, I am repeating very often, 
No crisis can be solved with poor military means, but no crisis can be solved without military means. And now let's say a few words on lethal identifying. And the language of power. As expressed also by European Union political leadership, as European, we must learn how to use the language of power. Both and those are power with the necessary capabilities in a more transversal integrated approach, achieving also in the military domain more strategic autonomy for our foreign policy. This immediately translates into, into sustained effort for CSDP military activities. Now I think there is a slide. As you know, European Union is currently engaged in three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia, but we say most in and around Africa, with three executive operations, Irini, Atalanta, and Altia, that means that our mission under Chapter 7 of the United Nations, a three non-executive mission in Mali, Central Africa, and Somalia, supporting the common foreign security policy of the Union. And indeed, we are trying to address the root cause of international instability. It's not the matter of uh, taking care only of the effects of the disease. We have to go to the root cause of the disease, either with direct action, like the Jaguar mission, or with training and capacity building, like in, in non-executive. But to note, one common element of this activity is the capacity building component, a peculiar domain in which the European Union, in addition to its uh, uh, traditional military engagement, has found an autonomous space. So it's completely basket of tools, playing an effective role in helping countries in need to work on their legs again. Of course, this is apparently even more valid for the non-executive activity, which provide training to armed forces and advice to the military leadership, but is valid also for executive mission. For your information, we are currently reviewing our training mission, making them more robust, from training to mentoring, and also accompanying. This will reinforce the perception of more influent European Union in the eyes of partners, member states, the international community, and why not our adversary and strategic competitors. But besides our mission and operation, in today's unfortunate circumstances characterized by the spread of the, military, of the virus, the military tools has proven to be also indispensable in supporting civilian authorities to, convey, to contain the pandemic. Thanks to its unique capacity to intervene where others cannot, bringing also, if necessary, deterrent to establish security conditions and allowing the other to perform their duties. In other words, no negotiation, no activity can be maybe useful run without having assist a military umbrella, a military protection and the military support. Let's say that overall the last few months have brought the opportunity to reflect on our capacity to act in exceptional crisis situations. While we can consider ourselves pretty satisfied with what we have achieved, I'm convinced that there are ample margins for improvement. For instance, I look at the role of European Union military chain of command as coordinator of effort by different stakeholders or in cooperation with NATO, an area in which we have to do a lot support the civilian organization for managing the pandemic. In fact, with more efficient already in place mechanisms, possible offset, we could provide more assistance for evacuation, medical aid, or better support to host countries of our CDP activity with extra advice and equipment. And sometimes that is a vital need to support the host country also for the security of our soldiers. But in these difficult circumstances, we could have done more, also by further contributing to the already ongoing mission and operation, supporting them with the adequate results. And we have to admit that sometimes 
the political level ambition is not supported by the meaning of the mission. All in all, being blunt, because I'm the highest ranking general in Europe, but I'm also the most senior and the old one. In a future scenario that has all the potential to be less secure than today, we claim to be militarily even better prepared and equipped to be able to take a crisis more briefly and efficiently. I'm thinking, first of all, on the need to revise our own command and control tools, the so-called military planning and conduct capability, an acronym that probably is connected to a European headquarter, currently limited in its function, but in the future able to fully coordinate mission and hopefully operational height of increasing magnitude through a permanent fully equipped European headquarter in Brussels. This will contribute to be resilient in the military dimension in line with similar European Union effort in social, economic, geographical, green and digital field. But in order to be fully effective on the ground, we will also need to work together toward more interoperable and fully capable armed forces. And this requires investment. This requires resources, of course. And now we come to the third part of the economic crisis. Unfortunately, and probably I'm not telling you anything you don't know already, the current crisis is presenting us with the symptoms of a recession with which the Fed budget may pay a price we cannot afford. In fact, while we must realize that security is the fundamental framework of our society to grow, we cannot let those budgets be infected by the virus. In this regard, a solution for facing scarcity of resources that may limit our choices can be pragmatically found by member states taking full advantage of the new European Defence Initiative. I am talking about all new mechanisms were specifically designed to identify and support European Defence with necessary tools to deliver credibility, while supporting member states in pooling available resources for common needs, spending together and spending better. Probably all of the ones that I'm going to describe is already known, so I will just touch them. First of all, we define the light goals for which my committee is responsible, basically in translation of the political level ambition into military requirements. Then in order to, break, to get a clear a current picture of member state defense plan pending a related problem, it was designed what is called the Coordinated Annual Review on Defense, that is called CAR. One of the poor results from this process, unfortunately, is that we realized that Member States displayed uh, European Union defense planning last after national and NATO requirements till today. Anyway, in order to be proactive and facilitate Member States acquiring the needed capabilities, we launched the permanent structural cooperation, the very well known PESCO. Then it's definitely a flagship initiative for a collaborative and cooperative approach by member states, supporting the development and procurement of defense capability, but by also making those capabilities easily available for European Union military mission and operation. And that is an important point because PESCO is strictly connected with the CSDP operation is the pillar for supporting the level of ambition of European Union in uh, operation. PESCO is currently undergoing its first strategic review. While it is indeed a relatively long instrument, it lacks sometimes a clear understanding by member states for its full potential. Therefore, we need now to regain the momentum announcing, announcing the direct linkage between PESCO and CSDB operational dimension, making tangible progress to a coherent spectrum force package, and that is important, a coherent spectrum force package to strengthen our ability to act. As the latest novelty, the European Union is also now looking at possible incentives that will help the participation, participating states to better fulfill the commitment, also by providing PESCO more visibility at the political level. 
But since I said the European Union is the only organization that has also financial means to sustain this project, it was also launched the most crucial, truly unique initiative, the European Defense Fund, a dedicated budget for research, innovation, development of prototype, and acquisition of defense equipment. And that is the second pillar because it's to reinforce the industrial base of European Union. At this stage, European Defense Fund needs to be swiftly and properly used. In fact, although the final budget has eventually dropped from the initial 13 to 7 billion, we can still count on an acceptable amount of funds, calling for a strong engagement by European institutions and member states in order to define the way to employ them at the best. Moreover, we must absolutely avoid the risk of meeting key opportunity to support the whole European defense project, including provide the benefit to the European defense industrial base with its small and medium enterprise, instead reducing the European Union dependency from external suppliers. And then this may be also possible to take advantage but, uh, by uh, what is called the recovery fund. Uh, for the part that is entitled for small and medium enterprise. And the combination of all the efforts I have listed so, listed so far, so a European Defense Initiative and for military mission and operation, will be instrumental to bring the ambitious objective of European strategy, uh, strategy, the European strategy autonomy, to reality. Which does not mean being autonomous from someone, but autonomous to do something along when necessary, or in better cooperation with our partners, primarily NATO, when possible. Now, what's next? We are living in an epochal moment, and the next few months will be crucial for the European defense, which, in my opinion, may be well on track to gain the full status of global security credible provider, based on two considerations. Firstly, because it's the only organization owning a well-recognized complex set of tools, politic, diplomatic, military, economic, for a too integrated approach to crisis management. Secondly, because the results achieved so far have been widely acknowledged by the international community, which is demanding even more European Union engagement. We have an opportunity, and European Union cannot fail as there are no realistic available alternatives to Europe. If a risk for failure is spotted, we must act immediately and decisively for the sake of credibility of the European Union foreign policy. What we need is the core response of commitment by member states, and that is in several areas. First, we must provide our CDP operation and mission, as already said, which often run in much contested area, maybe the most dangerous area in the world, the necessary personnel, access, and capability. Then, of course, we must maintain our pledge to European Union budget and initiative, like PET and DDF. I'm thinking also to the, uh, the military mobility, a flagship in European Union network cooperation, a network including railways, roads, and inland waterway suitable for military use also, with a length of over 160,000 kilometers. Unfortunately, at the moment, also this project is suffering a severe cut from 6.5 to 1.5 billion euros, we hope in the future to have additional funds. Additionally, very important, we also need to strengthen our capacity of action outside Europe, what is called the European Peace Facility, initiative recently financed with 5 billion euros. Also here, less than the, the eight initially proposed, but much better than nothing. That will increase the effectiveness of our CDP mission operation and assist in the build of capacity of partner countries armed forces to address security challenge. I just want to remember that uh, without considering Athena, in this moment, the uh, military operation cannot be found uh, by common, uh, commonly found by European Union, while the civilian mission, that are very often police mission, that are very often military police mission, can do. At the same time, we must keep on investing our global partnerships, starting from the relation with the United Nations. 
But of course, with NATO, for strategic activities like, as I said, and the mention of military mobility, but also continuing the alignment between our defense planning process, seeing what is good for European, for European Union, is also good for NATO, in accordance with the principle of single set of forces. And that a stronger European Union makes NATO stronger. Therefore, no duplication of this engagement from NATO, but a new world. Last but not least, we shall continue to invest energy with all our partners across the globe. As in particular, as we share with them many areas of concern about which we are running extensive dialogue for partner cooperation. Only by engaging in all the mentioned activity, we will be able to build up a European strategic culture of defense. A single way of looking at the world by defining, de defining common threats and challenges and the way to address them together. But strategic culture also has an institutional confidence and process to make use of military forces as a legitimate political instrument. All the above considerations will converge into the elaboration of our next cornerstone document, the strategic compass, a document that will provide police, uh, police orientation and priorities, explaining which security and defense responsibility the European Union wants to embrace with PSDP activity and other policies, for which purpose and through which operation. Work on the strategic compass is already initiated with the drafting of a shared analysis of threat expected in a few weeks from now. And then concluding, 2020 will be remembered as a crucial year for the European Union. With the traditional new crisis, the pandemic, the European answer to them with the recovery fund, the new defense initiative, like uh, the initiative that will have to decide to take off, with the US and Russia the designing the deployment, the Brexit, the role that China and other actors are seeking in this, in this scenario. European users have to learn how to speak with a single voice, have the strength and the commitment to be ambitious, but also to find common answers to common problems. Because in this moment, the crisis and the magnitude of the problems from the pandemic to the international crisis demand for the European Union to be even more protagonist. And member states have to be the first in understanding the urgency of a common answer. In such a historical moment, cutting funds for security and defense or not properly support this European initiative will provide the opposite perception with serious repercussions in near terms. Now, thank you very much. I'm ready for your comment or question, if any. And I hope it was not too long.